Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. Madam Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bilbrey Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Cohen. And I am here. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go out of order today. Uh, so just to let people know, we're going to start with Assembly Bill 109. Then we'll have the presentation from the Nevada Mining Association and then the presentation on lithium mining. Also, um, if anyone feels a little crushed in here, we do have an overflow room in 3142. So please feel free to um, go over to 3142 if you'd feel more comfortable. Uh, just some housekeeping though before we begin uh, with our with our hearing. Uh, please sign at least all electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining us online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noises. Uh, when testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. Uh, also, don't forget to spell your name at least the first time you say it. Uh, then turn the microphone off each time you're done speaking. As for handouts, please provide 15 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to our committee manager by 12 p.m. Uh, last business day. Um, for members of the committee, we expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting. Even if we may not agree with any uh, with, with each other's positions, we still expect uh, to show respect to everyone in the room. Committee members will be using our laptops and other electronic devices to view handouts and other documents. Please don't take this as a view of dis, um, as a sign of disrespect or inattention. Just uh, you know, keeping up with our modern age. Um, so with that, I will now open the bill hearing on AB 109, which establishes provisions relating to soil health and ask our own member, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch, to come to the table. Um, whenever you're ready, please begin. And members, there is a, a um, amendment and it's a new one. There was one that was um, on yesterday, but there is an updated one. So please refer to the most recent one uh, that's been uploaded to Nellis. And I believe, Chair, that we have a third member of our presenting panel zooming in. Do we need to wait for them? Oh, there he is. Okay, well, my name is Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record. That is spelled L-A space R-U-E space H-A-T-C-H, -H, because I like to complicate things. And I am here presenting on AB 109, and I will pass it quickly to my co-presenters to introduce themselves as well. I am Joe Frey, for the record. Uh, last name is F-R-E-Y. Um, and I, I guess I represent Rambling River Ranches as an owner in Fallon, Nevada. Hi. Good evening. I'm Jake Tibbetts. Um, many of you may know me. I'm the Natural Resource Manager from Eureka County. but. Um, this evening, I'm uh, testifying on behalf of the Eureka Conservation District and the Nevada Association of Conservation Districts. So together, here's a, a little bit of our bios to give you some background. I, as I said at our first meeting, grew up on a ranch, so I have a deep interest in agriculture. I also teach geography, which is the human relationship with the earth, and that's what brought me to this soil health work. I'm going to allow Jake and Joe just to give you a little bit of background as to their knowledge about soil health before we dive into this important issue. Um, I'm a fourth generation farmer. And 
I started. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but with um, if you could just make sure and state your name before yes. you speak each time. Thank you. Joe Frey, and a fourth generation farmer, uh, grew up ranching and farming in Fallon, uh, started a hemp company about five, six years ago, Western States Hemp, and uh, I think I'm about seven to ten years into my journey of regenerative ag. And so just here today to explain a little bit on what I've done and the things I've learned along the way. I guess my turn. <laughs> Jake Tibbetts for the record again, thank you. As you can see from my photo on the presentation, I'm not a very good fisherman. Um, and I'm a farm and ranch kid from Eastern Idaho, I'm born and raised on a farm and ranch there. Been in Nevada for 15 years, have a, a strong interest in sustainable agriculture and really benefiting our rural communities. I'm very involved with the conservation districts and a strong proponent of that locally led incentive based conservation model. And that's why I'm excited about this bill today. So Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record, this bill, AB 109, creates the Healthy Soils Initiative. This initiative will help promote regenerative agriculture within Nevada. Now, there are some examples on the slide, but Joe is a practitioner of regenerative agriculture, and so he is going to walk you through a little bit of uh, what it entails. Joe Frey, for the record. Um, the first thing that regenerative does is reduces chemical inputs. And a lot of this is um, a result of what some of these subsequent items are here on this slide. But personally, I've reduced the chemical and fertilizer inputs on my operation by about 85%. And I'm hopeful to see that number become a 100% reduction. Maybe not this year, but possibly by next year. Um, and, and some of the things that we do to accomplish that is reduce the soil disturbance. Um, agriculture is typically a very um, disturbing event. You know, we go through with plows and rippers and things like that. And, and um, conventionally, we like to see nice bare earth that makes what we would call a seed bed. And um, so we have converted to all no tillage where we just go through and plant the seed into what is already there. So that's the biggest way to reduce the physical soil disturbance, the chemical soil disturbance reduction comes from the reducing the chemical and uh, synthetic fertilizer inputs. Rotational grazing is a huge aspect of regenerative agriculture. There's a lot of amazing microbiology that happens inside of a cow's stomach that basically ends up moving down into the soil and allowing things to happen. So. Uh, rotational grazing or intensive grazing, as it's called, is where you mass a lot of cattle and try to simulate nature, how buffalo might have moved across um, the plains. You know, you put a lot of cattle on one area for a short period of time, and you move them on, and then you let that land rest, and you let the soil do its work. Um, cover crops are another technique that we um, highly implement. That was probably about our third step in the journey and um, basically what this does is it covers the soil and it allows for a much cooler and more moist environment which everybody's probably noticed that that's where worms and bugs that's where they like to live is in a cool moist environment and so by having cover crops it it provides that environment um, increased plant diversity is huge there's a, a major symbiotic relationship that happens in the soil with multiple different types of species, um, grasses, forbs, legumes, uh, things of that nature. So that's been very instrumental and that's probably been one of our final steps in the journey. I don't have a lot of experience with agroforestry, but um, we do uh, plant woody species into our fields at times for grazing. Uh, that stay small and sort of provide that sort of biology under the soil. Now, for the important part of this bill, why does it matter? Why do we want to increase our soil health? There are many, many benefits that come from increasing our soil health. And again, Joe is experiencing this firsthand, so I will let him walk you through some of those. Joe Frey, for the record. Um, so food quality is paramount in 
regenerative practices as a result of this. Um, I believe that by having the microbiology in the soil, our nutrition level of the food that we're producing is far superior than anything that you would get from synthetic fertilizers. I'm sure we've all been disappointed when we've picked up an expensive organic tomato even from Whole Foods and had it be pretty much tasteless. Um, that's because there's no biology happening in the soil. It's beautiful, it's big, it's ripe, but it just tastes like a little bit of lightly flavored water. Um, and, and regenerative is m very much more focused on quality over quantity. Um, and so that is something that uh, happens because of regenerative ag. Reduction in water use, I've seen about, it, depending on where I'm at in my journey, anywhere from a 10 to a 30% reduction on water consumption. And that also is dependent upon my water use at the time. But uh, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, you'll see an increase of 20,000 gallons of water holding capacity in one acre of land. And re regenerative ag really um, boosts the organic matter contained in soil. Um, it sequesters carbon, and it, it keeps that carbon cycle moving. But really, when stuff starts from an out-of-balance state, uh, you can sequester a lot of carbon into the soil out of our atmosphere with uh, soil conservation practices and increases farm profits. Um, so far on my farm, I have been focused on building my soil health, so I haven't yet seen the increased profits, but I have not lost any money either. I know that I could, um, in a heartbeat, see increased profits from what I've been doing. Okay, Selena LaRue Hatch for the record. So this is what AB 109 actually does. It creates the Healthy Soils Initiative because we have many different groups that are tangentially touching on soil health within our state agencies, but we don't have one place that is focusing on improving soil health. It creates an initiative that is entirely voluntary and consent-based. So our goal is to help our farmers and ranchers that want to transition to these regenerative practices have education and support with which to do so, because many times it, it requires upgrades of equipment, it requires changes in practices, and that is a scary thing to undertake if you don't have some sort of support to do that. It will be overseen by the Conservation Commission, and Jake will speak to just a moment why we put it in that specific uh, location. We are also going to give them a dedicated staffer to work solely on soil health. Soil health is under the purview of the Conservation Commission as it stands, but in talking to them and talking to their staff, there is so much under that commission that soil health tends to fall by the wayside, and they need this dedicated focus in order to work on it. Just importantly, just as importantly, we are creating an advisory board. This advisory board will have nine voting members. The makeup is within the bill text itself, but it includes specifically producers that are on the ground. So it lays out specifically the kind of ranchers or farmers. There's a tribal representative. There are representatives from the Department of um, Health, Agriculture, and Natural Resources so that we have that diverse experience included. And then perhaps one of the most important reasons that we need this program is it helps us access federal money. There are millions of federal dollars that we are not accessing because we do not have a healthy soils program. And those dollars are required to be funneled through a healthy soils program. So this would allow us to have a full-time staff member who is focused on getting that grant money and then passing it along to our farmers and ranchers as a method of support. Now I am going to pass it to Jake, who is going to talk about the conservation districts, explain a little of what they do and why we house them in this specific location. All right, thank you again, Jake Tibbetts for the record. Um, and again, why, why is the State Conservation Commission and the conservation districts that fall below that the best place to hold this initiative? Well, you can see the legislature, you've already you know, put this declaration in the statute about the importance of local communities stepping up to the plate and leading those efforts for that locally led conservation. That's already in place. If you were 48, there's some broad authorities, a lot of great enabling language in there, and it just is a natural fit to fall within that framework. Um, the map there on the left of the slide, that shows the various conservation districts throughout the state. There are 28 conservation districts covering the entirety of the state. They touch every square inch of Nevada. 
And they are built on that mantra of locally led voluntary incentive based conservation. They have existing relationships of trust already with farmers and ranchers and other people in their communities. Um, they're made up of, it's a mix, the board members for each conservation district are a mix of elected and appointed officials, depending on where you're at. Um, there's very formalized relationships that conservation districts already hold with many um, agencies and other entities, including the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, that are the NRCS, as, as you may have often heard. This formalized relationship is actually outlined in federal regulation and, and uh, federal manuals where conservation districts lead the effort to develop what are called local work groups. And they get these groups together to identify resource needs and resource concerns, natural resource needs and concerns. They funnel them through a formalized process to put some priorities up to the state NRCS and then even onto the national level to help uh, narrow down and be surgical on certain programming and funding that can be then brought back down to the ground through our agricultural producers to do good work on the ground. So that relationship already exists. There is a big need for capacity to help that process work more. And that's where we're hoping this bill can help us move that way. You may ask the question, you know, can't this be done without this legislation? And I guess that the short answer may be, but it, the reality is, is that establishing a formalized soil health initiative will do just as, as the assemblywoman mentioned, and it'll really help to, to provide that longevity and that durability through the conservation districts and give them um, a path for that capacity to actually deliver on the things that, that they're trying to do. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll mention on this is just last week, I spent much of last week at the National Association of Conservation Districts um, annual meeting. And I had the everybody I asked that I knew that it stood up state level uh, soil health initiatives through statute, asked them how it was going. Are there any you know hurdles that, that we need to be aware of as we're looking to do the same? And every one of the states that I talked to talked about the importance that these formalized initiatives have helped them with in their states and how it has helped them to identify the funding pools and to be able to get those funding pools on the ground in the right places with the producers that have the readiness and the willingness to get that work done. And conservation districts are that natural linkage. Um, and then in the fall of 2019, the Nevada Association of Conservation Districts held their annual meeting in Winnemucca. And uh, the focus of that meeting was soil health. And it was really around this topic we're talking about today. There were a lot of agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, conservation districts, other stakeholders and ag producers in the room at that meeting. And there was a desire to actually stand up a soil health program or a soil health initiative in the state and it was but here we are two and a half or three and a half years later i guess and the need for the capacity and the durability and the longevity and the formality i guess of a soil health initiative is very important to help us to continue to move forward because there is a lot of interest among people in this state for this this process and i'll turn it back okay selena larue hatch for the record and i am about to pass it right back but we talked about those economic benefits. Here are just some of the federal programs that we could access if we had this soil health initiative. And I'm gonna pass it right back to Jake, who's gonna talk a little bit about those programs. All right, thank you again, Jake Tibbetts for the record. So these are, these are you know a handful of programs that are available. Um, there's a big push um, towards these new pools of funds and trying to get them um, on the ground. Those entities, those states, those ag producers that are ready, it's all about readiness. Those ag producers that have the ability to implement these practices are going to be able to bring some of this funding to help them, to assist them to put in place some of these practices while also helping with their, their bottom line. And that's why this is needed because these funds are coming whether we stand up initiative or not. And we need to be able to have the ability to focus um, working again through our producers. That's what these funds are intended to get them on the ground to help our agricultural um, uh, communities in this state. So you can see there's a handful of things. Again, at the meeting I was at just last week, I, I received presentations on many of these 
the new, I won't call it a buzzword, but it is the new focus is this climate smart agriculture. Many of our agriculturists in this state are doing good practices already today that would meet the in, intent of climate smart agriculture, but there's additional things they could do if they just had the help to do it. And there, as, as the Assemblywoman mentioned, there's a whole host of things we need to be ready and have all the pieces in place, have that framework in place so we can access these funds, bring them home to Nevada and get good work on the ground to help all of our state and to help our rural uh, communities especially. And I'll turn it back. Selena LaRue Hatch for the record. So this is not just a Nevada thing. Talking about soil health is becoming a national conversation. You can see many states are starting to pass soil health legislation. And I would like to point out that this is something that both California and Utah agree on, which doesn't always happen, but I think is shows how critical this issue is. And in fact, Nevada did pass some soil health legislation um, last time around, but it was a, a resolution which said we value soil health. And so now I'm asking us to take a next step and take action on that resolution, showing that we do value soil health and we're willing to put this effort behind it. Now that is our presentation. So I am sure there are questions because soil health is absolutely riveting and we are here to answer them. Thank you for that. Before we uh, go to questions, can you um, just walk through the bill and the, um, the conceptual amendment, please? Selena LaRue Hatch for the record. So we have one small amendment, which is on section 59. It's the second to last page. We had language in the bill that said the fund uh, the money would go to the State Conservation Commission. We realized it needs to go specifically to the Conservation District program. So we just made that small change so that it's actually getting to the correct place. Thank you. And can you walk us through the, the rest of the bill? I certainly can. So um, the bill itself, essentially, if we, we start on page two, Page two includes uh, many definitions that you will find within the bill, including the commission, the government that we're referring to. It creates the Soil Health Advisory Board, which is nine voting members. That is a representative from the Department of Agriculture, a representative from the Division of Environmental Protection and uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, a representative from the Division of Public and Behavioral Health, which I had a question, why did we include public health? But public health deals with soil issues because that in, in fact affects our food supply. And so they wanted to have a seat at the table um, because of the food chain. Then we have uh, six members that are appointed by the commission. So we have a dairy farmer, a rancher, a specialty crop or small farmer, an irrigated crop producer, a tribal representative, and a person engaged in research related to soil health because we wanted to have that diversity of representation. Uh, then it goes on to say that the members of the board should be uh, geographically diverse so that we are representing the diverse parts of this state. It lays out the terms and the vacancy and the salary, which are all standard for uh, this commission. That is not something I created independently. We just took it right from that language. It then goes on to talk about the initiative. So this is section seven, page four. And it talks about the goals of the initiative. So encourage widespread adoption of soil health practices by agriculture producers, uh, promote and advance the understanding of the environmental and economic benefits of soil health, support and advance scientific research into soil health, including without limitation, and then it lists the existing conditions of agricultural soils and the carbon storage potential, uh, the economic benefits, and the environmental benefits. And then it goes on to say, what the commission may do. So it may provide incentives. So that's the incentive part we were talking about, helping our ag producers tr transition, conduct educational and outreach programs on the benefits of soil health, evaluate and develop soil health sampling and testing protocols, facilitate stakeholder collaboration to advance the understanding of the science of soil health, uh, collaborate with agricultural producers, um, and then a whole list of all the people they have to collaborate with and then enter into agreements or contracts, essentially do everything that they need to to make soil health get off the ground here in Nevada. And then it says that they may establish 
in Section 8, a program to distribute within limits of legislative appropriations and other available money, grants of money to eligible entities. So that's the grant program we were talking about to our ag producers. Uh, we shall prioritize distributing such grants to conservation districts that are working with agricultural producers. Uh, so that basically we're saying conservation districts that are working well with your local farmers and ranchers, we wanna make sure you're getting the money to actually pass along to those farmers and ranchers. And then we may prioritize the needs of historically underserved producers um, to make sure that this is an equitable bill as well. And then it goes on to give them other, um, like things that they can do, any other program that they deem appropriate. And then it's really important in section two that we establish that this is voluntary and incentive based. We're not forcing this on anyone. You have to want to be participate or to participate in this program. They can't mandate anything. They can't bind anyone to specific standards. It is education and then support in order to make that transition. And then um, it allows basically requirements for the grant recipients. They have to conduct outreach and education activities. They can't just get money and do nothing with it, right? They have to at least be trained on it and know what they're doing and then, and then share what they are doing. Uh, section nine creates the fund for soil health, which obviously we're not a money committee, but obviously we had to create the fund. Um, and then it allows them to accept and apply for gifts, grants, services, donations. So they're not run entirely on state money. And the goal is not to be run on state money. The goal is to access all of those federal funds that we are missing out on. There's also uh, a, part, a section in here that stresses that this is um, private information, that confidential information, we're not sharing the information of our ag producers. And then there's a whole lot of sections where they update to make sure it carries through the rest of the chapter. And I think that might be the bulk of it. And then there's that one last change in section 59, which I already discussed. So that is the bill in a nutshell. Thank you. And with that, I have a question from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll ask one question briefly, just because I didn't see this in the bill, but then I have, I have a real another question. Um, I noticed the pay is $80 a day, so people are clearly getting rich on this. But um, how often are you anticipating the, the meetings to happen? Uh, Assemblymember LaRue Hatch, for the record, thank you for that question. I did not put it in statute because I didn't want to be overly prescriptive. I think, I believe, and Jake can correct us on this, I believe that the Conservation Commission currently meets quarterly. I would imagine this advisory board would uh, do the same, but I wanted to leave that up to the commission and the staff member for that flexibility. Okay, now my real question. Okay. Um, so I couldn't see the slide with the map. I didn't have it on here. Um, I think it was slide six, and it kind of carved up Nevada and like the regions. And I was just wondering, because we I've heard we heard a lot from different parts of Nevada, but specifically in southern Nevada, have you seen successes? I mean, we know that we don't have great soil. It's like clay, sand, and caliche, you know, caliche. So I was wondering, have you seen successes? What does that look like? And I mean, is that ultimately what you're trying to find? I just am curious to, to hear what you found. Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record, I think, Jake, we might be passing that one to you because uh, you are the expert on the conservation districts. Yeah, thanks. Jake Tibbetts, for the record. So there is the it's CDSN, so everything's in acronyms, of course, but that's the Conservation District of Southern Nevada. And, um, you know, so that also covers areas like Moapa Valley, where you have a, a pretty diverse agricultural community there. Um, and so I, I know there's been some efforts. I know a board member of the, the Conservation District of Southern Nevada at one time was from the Moapa Valley area. So working specifically on those agricultural soils. Um, you know, you have Mesquite, you have a lot of these other areas within that district where there are some ag areas. And, I, and then, you know, there's also the urban ag component. Um, the Zions Community um, Park that some of you may be aware of there in Las Vegas that, that um, uh, uh, can't remember garden urban garden sorry excuse me and struggling for words but the urban garden there that was actually partially developed with some uh, 
grant funding that came from the National Association of Conservation Districts. And the conservation district down there was very, um, worked with the Zions Community Park to help establish some of that. So, you know, this can run the gamut from large ag production to even the small, you know, backyard gardens and, and um, urban tree plantings and things like that. Soil health matters, you know, every acre counts and even those small acres of soil health can be a big deal. Assembly member Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for the presentation. Uh, very well done. I appreciate the reference to past legislation. I believe uh, Mr. Tibbetts was involved in uh, incorporating some of that soil health language in, in their last session. Uh, I have probably two questions, but I guess um, the first one is related to season, seizing these federal um, grant opportunities that uh, that were provided. And so to, to any of you um, who can provide a little bit of additional context on that, uh, it, sound, it sounds like there are many out there. Some we may be applying for maybe for different things. Um, some we probably aren't really positioned to apply for. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any sense of the, the potential amount of money that could be leveraged through the through the establishment uh, of this initiative you know what what new funds could we maybe be looking at uh, bringing to the state and just any any uh, additional information you could provide in terms of that so Selena LaRue Hatch for the record I appreciate that question because that was one of my first questions when we started looking at these uh, federal opportunities we have had a very hard time tracking down a firm number just because it is so nebulous and there's so many programs. But I think Jake has been able to speak to at least a, a s approximate dollar amount for some of these programs. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Jake Tibbetts for the record. Through you did a assembly one. Um, so thanks for the question. And you know, I, I don't want to to go out there on a limb and and um, you know, overstate what the opportunities here. But if you've just followed the, the BIL, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the IRA, um, we're bumping up against a new farm bill right now. There's a lot of efforts in Congress to reauthorize the farm bill. Um, and there, there's literally billions of dollars, not to come to Nevada, but available for the through farm bill programs, through some of these others for these climate smart agricultural opportunities. And that really, I think the sky is really the limit for us, you know, for agriculture and for helping some of our ag producers in this state through some of this programming and helping, you know, uh, them to leverage some of the things they're already doing and just push it to the next level. And um, it's all about readiness. Again, the funding, some of these funding pools are there right now. But we're we're missing opportunities because we simply don't have the capacity to to de determine where they should be and finding those producers that have the willingness and the readiness right now to get those things on the ground. And I think if this were in place today, we would be well ahead in determining those areas and and applying for those funds and working with some of our, you know, federal partners, state uh, agencies, and then even some you know other NGOs to get uh, some of this on the ground. So I really think, you know, I hope I can come back in a few years and when this moves forward and say that, that we were right, that we were able to bring and leverage millions of dollars and resources to help our ag uh, producers and our states and our rural economies. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And I understand with competitive, first of all, just trying to find out how much is out there and the amount that it's awarded can vary. And I know that in many cases this is competitive and kind of dependent. So uh, appreciate uh, providing that additional information. And uh, I guess pardon, pardon my tendency to turn this into a, a budget hearing. Um, uh, I guess just at a high level. Um, so the concept there is to uh, you know, initially get money in again for that capacity. So is pr probably most of the funding going to go to some staffing capacity and uh, a little bit go to grants at the outset with the hope that we can then 
position ourselves to pull in additional resources that can really um, uh, add to what's going on on the ground. Assemblymember LaRue Hatch, for the record, you hit the nail on the head of exactly what we're trying to do. So the 200000 which, again, obviously, we're not the money committee, but we are trying to stand up enough for one staff member and then maybe have between Twenty and 50000 left over for these this education and these grants, and then for that to grow with time as they are leveraging more federal funds. Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the uh, visual for how regenerative ag takes a group of cows to fertilize the land. Thank you. Uh, my question is really relative to the makeup of the six members appointed by the commission. Um, I'm curious to know about representation um, and percentage. Uh, I'm sure that you are aware or know the numbers. What percent of our farmers are dairy farmers? What percent are ranchers? What percent are small farmers or specialty crops? Like, is there adequate representation in this commission to account for each one of those specific industries within ag? Okay, Assemblymember LaRue Hatch for the record. So we did not look at specific percentages. We more wanted to make sure that anyone that was in this space had a voice within this commission because while we may have many more ranchers than dairy farmers, the dairy farmers still should have a say. And so we, we more looked at this not necessarily percentage-wise por proportionality, but just making sure that each of the, the groups that we think have a say in soil health had a seat at the table. Assemblymember DeLong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the presentations. I'd actually uh, have a, actually a, a comment to begin with and then a question, and that is what you're describing is very similar to my experience from the 80s in the Palouse in eastern Washington and what they were doing with the wheat farming there and how they tried to maintain the soils and improve the conditions. So uh, it's great to see that. Um, as far as the position that's being hired, it really sounds not like a soil specialist. It sounds like a grant writer. Is that what's being envisioned? Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record, I don't know that it's just a grant writer. Uh, I, we didn't prescribe specifically the requirements for that position, and I think we would leave that up to the discretion of the uh, conservation districts. However, they would grant do grant writing. They would also assist the board in their meetings and in carrying out whatever the board wanted as far as their initiative. They would assist in the education and putting together the um, symposiums or whatever else the board decided to do. And so I don't know that they would need just grant writing specialty. I think that they would also assist in the overseeing the program. And Chair, I have a follow-up. Thank you. Um, section 8.3 point C uh, parentheses one uh, discusses one of the requirements of anyone that's receiving a grant and um, farmers have a very busy schedule you know to um, dawn to dusk or longer since they have usually have headlights on the tractors so um, I'm a little concerned about that section saying if someone gets a grant they've got to conduct outreach and education along with trying to run their farm how are you envisioning that happening Joe Frey, for the record, um, I currently do some of that as it is now, and I guess it's just how I staff the farm and, and make sure that I allow time to do educational seminars and outreach type events. Um, so I would imagine it is conceivable to say that monies could be allocated to staff farms properly to allow that education to be conducted, or um, you know, maybe some of that could also be not necessarily the individual farmer as, as that unit, but maybe a group of farmers or an association that were to do educational outreach in an area, possibly, would be some of my thoughts. 
Yeah, and Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record, I would also add that I don't know that it has to be extensive outreach or extensive education. It could be as much as saying to your neighbor, hey, I'm, I'm trying out a no-till drill, and here's how it's going for me, right? It's, I think the reason that that was in there, and I will say that that was also in the Utah legislation, which is we adopted some best practices from Utah. The reason it's in there is a lot of our ag community operates on that word of mouth, right? Like you, we can have a soil scientist come in and tell you how great it is to use a no-till drill. But if you've been farming in the same way for the last 50 years and no one around you is changing, you're not necessarily gonna be as open as if Joe comes down the street and says, hey, here's what I'm doing. It hasn't hurt my profits. Here's why I like it. It might actually save you money in the long run. And Madam Chair, could I add something? Please go ahead. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Jake Tibbetts for the record. And I think, you know, if you look, uh, Assemblyman, uh, earlier in that same section about the funding, it's, I think that's why there's the priority to distribute those grants to conservation districts that are working with ag producers, with those districts, you know, having that ability to assist those ag producers in meeting the intent of those grants. So it's the, almost like a pass through where the, the district helps the producer, but also helps with those obligations. You know, like many conservation districts do uh, manage many grants and then also can, you know, receive some, some overhead from those to help them to meet these obligations. So that's why, again, I feel it's very important for the districts to be linked here because it can help these producers and meeting some of those obligations that are outlined in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I, I have a question about the makeup of the board and the number. It, I, some of our boards have trouble making quorum, and it, and when I read the nine member board, it did give me some concern. Um, do you have any? any way that you think you're going to be able to address that? Yes, Assemblymember LaRue Hatch, for the record, we don't specify that this has to meet in person. And so we're hoping that if they can't meet a quorum in person, that they can probably meet virtually or they can take other methods. I will also pass it to Jake, who can speak to the Conservation Commission and their difficulties or not with meeting quorum. Yes, thanks. Jake Tibbetts, again, for the record. So, you know, it's um, farmers and ranchers are very bu busy people. So your your concern isn't, you know, unfounded in that way. But those that are engaged in this space are very active. Though, you know, the hope is to get individuals that, that represent the broad diversity of agriculture and, you know, the tribal interests and others on this advisory board, but that have ownership, have skin in the game and have the willingness to see this program go forward. So. You know, I myself tend to show up at things when I feel there's progress being made. And I think it's on the conservation districts and the State Conservation Commission and through this initiative to make sure that it is something we're showing up for. And I, I really don't think there'll be much difficulty in keeping a quorum, keeping everybody together attending if it's we're all pushing towards actually doing good things on the ground. Thank you, Assembly Member Kerr. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think the, the uh, presentation really cleared up a few things in my mind. A lot of questions were answered that I had here. I was a little concerned about creating another bureaucracy inside government. And where was that money coming from? There was no fiscal note on this. So I was concerned about that and still am. But I have two questions. What impact, if any, will this have on current grazing allotments on public land? And are there any strings attached to those grants? Okay, we are, this is Selena LaRue Hatch for the record. We are gonna phone a friend with Jake on the first question. Uh, Jake, do you have an answer to that one? Jake Tibbetts for the record. Um, so uh, Madam Chair, through you to the Assemblyman. Um, the, uh, the bill, you know, very clearly says that it's to be voluntary and incentive based and in no way can can dictate any kind of standards for anybody to met it is in that's again the mantra that's why the conservation district again i'm such a believer in that 
uh, program is because it is about working with people using carrots rather than sticks. And I don't see any impact this will have on grazing allotments other than helping people make any changes that are necessary in a voluntary way if those changes are necessary. So again, it's people, the willing people that want to come to the table and if they want the help, great, but there's, this isn't going to be imposed on anybody. And, you know, I wouldn't be standing here today testifying on this bill if I felt, felt other, that it would go otherwise. Madam Chair, yeah. what about the second question? I was just going to follow up. Uh, could you repeat the second question, please? What if any strings are attached to these grants when they come out? Okay, thank you. Selena LaRue Hatch for the record. So that is on page five. So page five, this is section A, subsection three. Um, it says, and I'm trying to find the place for it. So it says that if you do not and this is section B, sorry. Uh, if you do not have expertise in soil health practices or project management, you need to work with technical assistance agency or organization. So again, you can't just get money and then go out and not do any regenerative ag. So if you're getting this money, you will have to um, consult with someone that is an expert in this. Like we said um, with Assemblyman DeLong's question, you would have to talk to your neighbors or do some kind of outreach to say what you are doing. Uh, you would need to disclose, this is on page six, disclose information relating to what you're doing probably back to the, the Conservation Commission. And then uh, the next one is that you need to um, be looking at the most accurate and current scientific evidence relating to soil health. So there are limitations, right? It is voluntary. We're not forcing this on anyone, but we're also not just giving out free money for you to continue doing what you've been doing the whole time. You need to consult. It will be overseen by the Healthy Soils Initiative. They will check in to make sure you are following the practices that you said you wanted to practice. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, we're going to move on to support. Right. So um, for support, as a reminder, support is for the bill as it is drafted with the conceptual amendment. So even if you love the bill, but there's a little something that you want to change and you want to talk to the um, presenter about, remember, you still have to come in as opposition, but you can come in as opposition and let us know you love the bill, but you just have a little change. Uh, so just please keep that in mind. Also keep in mind neutral is you are just providing information. It's not support light. It's not opposition light. Um, so with that, we are going to start with um, support in Carson City. So gentlemen, please uh, start filling in the chairs and just go ahead when you're ready. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Doug Busselman, B-U-S-S-E-L-M-A-N. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Nevada Farm Bureau. Nevada Farm Bureau policy adopted our most recent annual meeting states that we support educational sessions and workshops for the purpose of helping and understanding regenerative agriculture, both the practices and the principles. This position is at the core of AB 109 and is the reason for our support for passage of this legislation. Farm Bureau's philosophy of soil conservation conservation is based on voluntary and incentive-based approaches. This is another concept within the direction called for in AB 109. We also welcome the direction provided through the bill for support in advancing research that is oriented to Nevada local soil conditions in our environment. Our agriculture, soils, and environment are different than the Midwestern model and most of the commodities that are produced and are most recognized across the country. AB 109 clearly directs prioritization of distribution of grants through Nevada's conservation districts, another foundational principle which we support. 
We support conservation practices which fit in the operational plans of agricultural producers. We encourage our members to engage with their local conservation districts to promote sound conservation. Passage of AB 109 with the funding for operation as well as the ability to use donations and grants which flow through the Fund for Soil Health are important elements which can assist in building this program. We encourage your support for passage of this bill in the committee as well as discussions on where Nevada's next biennium budget should be spent in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Madam Chairman, uh, good evening and uh, members of the committee. My name is Davey Sticks and I'm a member of the Nevada Cattlemen's Association. I'm here today as the chair of the Legislative Affairs Committee. Our organization represents producers that run livestock both on public grazing and private. And I just really in a plain simple way sum up how important and how glad we are about this bill today because finally there's some light being shed on a very positive thing that can come from cattle with the sequestering of CO2. <laughs> My friend Joe Frey back here, and I'm, I'm gonna literally show you how it works and how simple it is. My friend Joe Frey back here produces feed that we feed our cattle. And literally what comes out of our cow is processed, put into a truck and hauled to his facility and that same truck brings the raw feed product back to feed our cattle. That's how cool it is. And on public grazing, if anything, I hope that this will shed some light on what proper grazing, no matter what species of livestock is on that grazing, proper grazing and management of that uh, resource, what can happen as a positive with this type of initiative. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Greetings, Chair Cohen and members of Assembly Natural Resources. My name is Kelly Kelly. That's the same name twice, but spelled differently, K-E-L-L-I and K-E-L-L-Y. The opinion that I'm expressing today is my own, but it is informed by over a decade of working with small-scale agricultural producers through my roles uh, as the director of the Fallon Food Hub and as the agricultural advisor for the Nevada Small Business Development Center. The farmers and ranchers that I work with grow plants in the unique high desert climate of the most arid state in the country. There is increasing interest in the integration of regenerative agricultural practices in order to cultivate better soil health, to retain more water, which as we all know is our most precious and our most limited natural resource, and to reduce costly chemical inputs on their land through cover cropping, crop rotation, rotational grazing, and the use of no-till systems. One of the farm partners recently, one of our farm partners, who you actually heard from today, Joe Frey, recently hosted a regenerative agriculture and soil health workshop in Fallon in partnership with UNR Cooperative Extension, which was attended by over 70 producers wanting more information. These producers need help. They need more educational opportunities. They need access to experts who are working in partnership to integrate better soil health techniques, and they need access to additional resources to put into place regenerative systems, and then a system to monitor and measure the improvements in their soil composition. AB 109 creates the program that will be this needed resource for farmers. The Healthy Soils Nevada Initiative will position the state to be able to take advantage of federal pass-through funding opportunities to fund grants for Nevada farmers. And a formalized system of measuring soil health improvements will help Nevada farmers take advantage of incentives that are coming in the upcoming Farm Bill. This is going to help our farmers move past just the early adopters of regenerative agriculture techniques and incentivize more focus and concern for soil health in our state. I encourage you to pass AB 109. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the Assembly uh, Committee. Um, my name is Doug Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, and I am the president of the Nevada Association of Conservation Districts. I've been associated with conservation and conservation districts for quite a while. I also serve as a um, commissioner on the Nevada State uh, Com uh, Conservation Commission, and I also serve on my local conservation district board. Um, as you heard from Jake Tibbetts, who is a member of our board, um, the association supports this bill. 
Um, the thing I'd like to add to what Jake uh, already said in support of it, I'm going to do two things. One, go back to uh, 1972 when I took um, soils at the University of Nevada <coughs> in the College of Agriculture. And um, our professor, um, uh, Frederick, or Freddie Peterson, um, said that uh, the stuff without organic material, that is called dirt. This over here with organic material is called soil. You can grow things in soil. You cannot grow things in dirt. So, you know, when we, when we talk about regenerative, um, and it's a new buzzword, for what farmers and producers have been doing forever, understanding the importance of organic matter in their soils and continuing on with it. So we're not asking somebody to do something that isn't what is in their heart anyway. Um, going to all, uh, all non-organic or all uh, produced fertilizers is not good in the long run. Producers know that. They want to do the right thing. They want to learn right things. The second thing I want to do is, is go back to the Nevada Association's annual meeting just four months ago. We had a panel there uh, made up of one of your members, uh, Assemblyman Watts, and two senators, uh, Senator Titus and Senator Gokachia. And in that meeting, a couple of things happened. One, we got to showcase four farmers who are doing amazing things with soils in their lands. Um, we got to hear from a farmer in uh, Fallon who is producing teff and his importance to soil. He's saving water, he's growing more with less and being able to make a profit. We also heard from um, a gentleman who did a soil health demonstration. This demonstration showed two soil types having the same composition, physical composition, one having 1% organic matter, the other having 4% organic matter. And you remember what happened in this assemblyman Watts. In that, when you add water to it and you filter it through it, this, water, this soil held up, the one with the 4% organic matter, the one with the 1% or less than 1%, it fell apart. The water just ran off, the soil ran off. So you lose the soil. And farmers are the best conservationists in the world. They want to do what preserves what they do for their grandchildren. And that's what conservation and conservation districts do, is to present practices that will make it so your farm will be there a generation, two generations, three generations from now. And just as a reminder, back in the Dust Bowl, science and locally led conservation got together and created the Soil Conservation Service, now the NRCS, and conservation districts. We are created by an act of Congress and act of legislature. We are locally led subdivision of the state of Nevada that works with farmers, works with producers, and our goal is to share information so that the people like the phrase who are Growing, this is, we, when we did our tour, we got to go to the Frey Ranch, and I gotta tell you, Sir? if you haven't been there, my time's up. Sir, uh, up. <laughs> uh, but if you haven't been there, they grow their own crops, and they produce some of the best um, sipping whiskey, and it's for drinking, not for fighting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir, and I'm sorry, I was, I was very remiss in, in reminding everyone to, uh, to keep it to two minutes, but that was my fault, so thank you very much. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Melissa Gilbert, uh, G-I-L-B-E-R-T. I work for Reno Food Systems. We are a nonprofit in Reno. We lease five acres of land, and we are practicing regenerative agriculture. If you would like a tour of our agroforestry project, we've planted, in the last four years, we've planted hundreds of fruit trees, shrubs, pollinator. We are a beautiful project, and we are in full support of this bill. And I welcome you to come for a tour if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christy Cabrera-Georgeson, C-A-B-R-E-R-A. G-E-O-R-G-E-S-O-N. I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League here in support of AB 109. Soil is vital for plants, animals, people, and the planet as a whole. 
ensuring soil health can improve air and water quality, food security, and carbon sequestration, helping us tackle the climate crisis. Additionally, creating a healthy soils initiative will allow the state to gain access to federal funds that we may not currently have access to. Um, so long story short, we urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly, Great Basin Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. We are in support of this bill. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else in Carson City, we'll go to the very patient lady in Las Vegas. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of the committee. My name is Sheila Bray, spelled S-H-E-I-L-A space B-R-A-Y from the University of Nevada, Reno. The University of Nevada, Reno would like to express support for Assembly Bill 109. AB 109 speaks to the continuation of increased awareness of soil health and agricultural practices in Nevada and aligning our communication with agriculture producers to support agriculture as a top industry in our state. The University of Nevada Arena would like to thank the sponsor and presenters for bringing forth this bill and for including members of higher education within the established advisory board to bring the latest in scientific research and communities communication to our communities to this effort. I appreciate your time and would urge your support for Assembly Bill 109. Thank you. Anyone else in Las Vegas in support? Okay. Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the phones? To provide testimony and support of Assembly Bill 109, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller, My you name are is unmuted. Dana. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please Hello? go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jane Amon, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, -A -A and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Madam Chair and members of the committee, the Nature Conservancy supports AB 109 to establish a Soil Health Advisory Board Initiative and Fund. Healthy soils cycle and store carbon, improve water security, and they play a critical role in helping us both mitigate and adapt to climate change. As many others have pointed out, there are abundant opportunities on the table right now to leverage state funds with federal and private funds to improve soil health. We submitted a written testimony with specific examples. The establishment of a formal advisory board who monitors soil health and administers a fund would demonstrate Nevada's readiness to leverage these federal funding and assistance opportunities. Additionally, as a nonprofit conservation organization, that works nationally and internationally to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends, the Nature Conservancy has been working on soil health for a number of years. Our written testimony offers links to resources that the Nature Conservancy has developed relating to soil health. In closing, we wanted to suggest that if the state is looking for places to spend surplus revenue, seeding a soil health fund would be a good investment for both our agricultural producers and our climate. Thank you for hearing our comments. Thank you. Uh, BPS, anyone else in support on the line? Hello. Yes, caller, you are my name is, Hello, my name is Nick Christensen, N-I-C-K-C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-S-O-N, -S -S representing the Sierra Club. Dirk Cohen and members of the committee, on behalf of the club and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm speaking in support of AB 109 on the creation of the Healthy Soil Initiative. Soil health is an essential tool in our efforts to combat climate change, decrease soil erosion, sequester carbon, and protect our water resources. Soils have strong carbon sequestration properties, and we believe this is an understudied benefit of our soil in Nevada, one that should be included in the work of the Soil Health Advisory Board. Many states have created similar institutions to help their citizens and farmers understand and implement the latest science for helping farming and grazing. Maryland, Utah, and Colorado are just a few of these. The state of Colorado recently received a $25 million grant from the Swing Saving Tomorrow's Agricultural Resources Program for the United States Department of Agriculture through the Partnerships for Client Smart Commodities Project. This investment for Colorado's farmers, ranchers, and agricultural communities means a significant influx of funds to help producers handle the financial risks of adopting new climate and rangeland practices that advance soil health and climate resilience. 
There is the potential for Nevada to receive these or similar funds. However, we feel it's far more likely to obtain these if such an advisory board and its leadership as uh, envisioned by this legislation is in place. For these reasons, we urge you to support this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. BPS. Chair, there are no more callers in support. Thank you, BPS. Okay, coming back to Carson City, anyone in opposition? Okay, seeing none, anyone in Las Vegas in opposition? BPS, anyone on the phones in opposition? To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 109, please press star 9 now to rate, take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify. Thank you. Okay, coming back to Carson City for neutral. Let's go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of the Assembly Committee of Natural Resources. I'm James Settlemeyer, Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Melanie A. Ten, who is the head for the Conservation District Program, sends her regrets. She was not able to attend today. Uh, in that respect, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I would actually give my comments to the bill as requested amended so I can delete half the testimony. Go ahead. That being said, thank you. Uh, Melanie did reach out to the sponsor of the bill. She graciously agreed with the uh, changes and amendments, and therefore those don't need to necessarily be discussed. We look forward to the passage of the bill with the amendment, uh, with also the funds. Without the funds, it's very problematic. We are neutral to the bill. We are supportive of the concept, but we'll have to wait and see what the final language of the body comes out, and then we would implement it accordingly to the legislative intent. If it's okay, I would speak to one of the comments or questions that was put forward by Mr. Watts, kind of asking about how much money would be spent on travel and things of that nature. I can give an estimate if you so wish. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. For reference, on the Conservation District Program, pays the State Conservation Committee commission members an average of 13213 for each board member, daily pay, travel expenses, and per diem over the last few years. That's just a generalized average. The requested amount in AB 109 would cover these costs for that advisory board and pay the associated uh, travel and per diem costs. But coupled with additional employee salary, that money then would be left over for the implementation of seeking grants. So that just kind of gives a general ballpark of what these funds would do. And again, without those funds, it'd be very problematic to try to have the bill go forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anyone else in Carson City in neutral? Seeing none, anyone in Las Vegas in neutral? Seeing none, BPS, anyone on the phones in neutral? Right. To provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 109, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in neutral. Thank you, BPS. Assemblywoman, would you like to make a closing statement? Thank you, Madam Chair. So thank you to all of my colleagues who uh, listened to our presentation on soil health and why it matters. I would just like to stress clearly there are a large number of people and stakeholders that believe this is worthwhile, that believe that this is something that we need in our state. And I would just like to point out this is one of those bills that has both Cattlemen's and Farm Bureau and Sierra Club and Nevada Conservation League on the same page. I don't know how much more bipartisan we can get, so I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. With that, I will close out the hearing on AB 109, and we will go into our um, presentations. We're gonna start with our presentation from the Nevada Mining Association, and I will ask Nikki Bailey Lendahl, the Director of Government Affairs, and her team to come forward and go ahead um, when you are ready.
Good afternoon, committee. Um, my name is Nikki Bailey Lundahl. Like uh, the chair said, I'm the director of government affairs for the Nevada Mining Association. Thank you so much for having us today. Alongside me is Joe Riney, vice president of operations, and Kyle Davis, our environmental uh, consultant, as well as Alan Biaggi, who does not fit at this table, but will be here for any questions uh, after the presentation. So what is NVMA? The Nevada Mining Association's mission is to unite, advocate, and serve as the public voice of Nevada's modern mining industry. We are uh, 500 plus member companies representing every part of the mining supply chain, operators, exploration, suppliers, and individuals, all throughout the state, including the urban course. So what is my modern mining in Nevada? Modern mining is 10.3% of all U.S. non-fuel mineral production comes from this state. We produce 20 essential minerals critical to our daily lives, and 15 of Nevada's 17 counties have active mine operations. The mining supply chain has a presence in all 17 counties, and we generate about $14.8 in annual economic activity. So this map shows you where our mines are in Nevada. Yellow is obviously metals, red industrial materials, purple gemstones, uh, black and white oil and gas, and green is our geothermal. Our people, actually right now, we are not 37,000 family strong. We are 38,000 family strong across Nevada that rely on mining supply chain for our employment with our average salary at about $94,000 a year, including benefits, health care, retirement, and sick leave, not just for our employees, but for the entirety of their families. We are an essential Nevada industry. We have 1% of employment in the state, 1.9% of all sales and use tax. We're 3.1% of the state general fund, which will be changing with the mining education tax, 4.1% um, of the state GDP. So this is a graph of where we've come from 2013 to where we were in Q1 of 2022. And this is our total estimated mining taxes paid. We were at, in 2021, $348.4 million. This does not include the mining education tax, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. So my mining education tax was um, came out of the 2021 <coughs> session uh, within its inaugural year. Half of that tax is the uh, mining education and the other tax is the net proceeds of minerals that would now be combined. That's $344 per annual pupil contribution. And within 10 years, that would be 3,441. And when we aggregate that to our 10-year contribution, that's 1.7 billion going into education. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Joe Riney, um, our vice president. Joseph Riney, for the record, R-I-N-E-Y, here to talk to you a little bit about safety and health. Uh, in the mining industry in 2021, worked over 28 million hours. Um, we have some of the lowest safety records uh, in, the, in, in the state, as well as in the nation. So our, our safety standards are very high. Uh, we look at regulatory standards as the basis, and what we do is like to go above and beyond that. So most mine operators are going far above and beyond. Uh, we also are very collaborative when it comes to working with uh, state and federal regulators as far as safety and health goes. So we are always looking at how can we improve safety and health, not just for Nevada, but uh, nationally. Some of the training that we do uh, with, our mine, with our mine response teams is a lot of preparation for emergency response. So most of our emergency response teams don't actually get to use their, their skills and abilities. Uh, most of the time where they find those skills and abilities is when somebody on I-80 traveling between Reno and Elko uh, is in a car accident or something. Most of the time what you'll find is our emergency responders driving to and from work are the first ones on the scene uh, and rendering aid there on the highway. Uh, they also train, it's a, it's a volunteer uh, position, so in addition to their normal job, they're doing uh, many hours of training a year. Uh, the mine rescue teams train in surface, underground, firefighting, hazardous uh, materials response, as well as most carrying uh, EMT certifications. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kyle Davis, and I'm here today on behalf of the Nevada Mining Association. 
This is an appropriate slide for me to come in on. Um, Nevada has been a leader in uh, the advancement of clean energy over many years, and I've had the pleasure of working with many of you in this body um, to expand those opportunities and uh, see places where we can continue to make strides here. But the fact is that the minerals that are produced in Nevada are crucial for the expansion of the clean energy industry. And there are many projects that are happening here in Nevada that are very exciting that are going to continue to help us be that leader as we move to uh, decarbonize our economy. A lot of people talk about the amount of land that is required for a uh, mining operation. But when you look at Nevada, obviously Nevada is a very large state. We're in the top 10 in terms of uh, total size, even though uh, our population fits into a much smaller area. But as you can see on this map, um, total mer permitted mining acres is only about 200,000 acres. So it's about 0.3% of the state's land mass. Water is also an important issue, and we're seeing that this session. There's already been a number of water bills filed, and we've heard a lot of talk about uh, how our state is dealing with, uh, with, with drought. When you look at overall water consumption in Nevada, and this graph um, really spells that out for you, you can see that mining and milling is only about 8% of, uh, and this is groundwater use. So when, we're when we talk about the water that is, that is consumptively used by the industry, we're really only talking about groundwater. It's only 8% of, of that. So what you can see here with this, uh, with this uh, diagram here um, is what happens when you, what happens in open pit mining. So we ha we've had, we've had a, a graphic in previous presentations, but a lot of times the ore body that, um, that the, the metals exist in that, we are, that we're trying to get at um, exists below the water table. And so in order to get at that, we have to dig a uh, pit below the water table and obviously we need to get that water out of the way to be able to access that ore body. When mining and dewatering in, so we dewater that pit and pump that water out but essentially put it right back into the ground. So when we finish the mining operation, groundwater seeks to return to pre-pumping levels. And what you can see in this graphic, uh, there's a couple of different types here, but essentially that water fills back in back to that original groundwater level. Now that is still groundwater and that is still available under Nevada's water law and that can be appropriated according, uh, under existing water law. One other point that I would point out on, on this is that it, there does become an issue of evaporation from that water and the state engineer did take action on that and every new pit that is created now must, uh, must have a water right for that, con for that evaporative component. So at the end of a mining operation, you do end up with these pit lakes. Uh, some pits are backfilled through the process of, of mining, but some are not. And in some cases, you do end up with, uh, you could create uh, concerns if you did backfill that pit. So it's not done in all cases. But sometimes the issue of public access does come up. But public access may not be appropriate in all cases. In some cases, you have steep walls. You, uh, you have the potential for rock slides and erosion. But in some cases, it may make sense. And what you see in that picture, that, that bottom picture, that's the Sparks Marina, uh, which is a great example of a, you know, what was a, uh, a gravel pit and now is a great recreational resource for people in northern Nevada. This issue of access did come up in a previous session. I had the pleasure of working on that bill with uh, then Assemblyman David Bobzine uh, that, uh, that required an evaluation of potential public access for existing and future pits. And that has been done. Um, at this time, uh, in pits that, were, that did not at this point have access, they, it was, they were not deemed access, acceptable for public access given the conditions. But this, these can always be reevaluated as well. So this is an issue that um, came to the legislature, uh, the industry worked in, in concert with, uh, with organizations to figure out a solution and have that framework in place for the future. So when I mention reclamation, that's an important part of every mining operation and that is, it is required by law and the industry worked uh, with the state of Nevada a while ago, back in the 80s, to put these, uh, to put these uh, provisions into place. Nevada has leading, uh, leads the nation and the world in terms of having uh, statutes in place that govern reclamation. The companies are responsible for doing so a lot of times concurrently while they are still, while they are still mining. To ensure that this does happen, 
they must post financial instruments in the event of a default. So if the mining company goes away, the state holds that money to be able to complete that reclamation. And currently, the state of Nevada holds about $3.4 billion in bonding to ensure that reclamation is completed. In addition to what I've talked about with, when, as it relates to water, as it relates to uh, reclamation, there are a number of other regulatory environmental programs that the industry is subject to and works uh, with the state to ensure that these programs are followed. These, includes program, these include programs dealing with air pollution, uh, solid and hazardous waste, protection of wildlife, cultural resources, vegetation management, as well as cleanup of any spills or land contamination that may occur. And this is just a list of state agencies that have mining oversight responsibilities. As you can see, we work with a, uh, a good portion of, of our state government uh, to ensure that uh, mining operations, um, we follow all applicable laws and do things that, that do protect the environment. And these are just the state uh, responsibilities. As you can see, a number of different um, uh, number of different agencies there. In addition, there are federal agencies that we work with as well. Certainly the Mine Safety and Health Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Bureau of Land Management, and the Forest Service come immediately to mind. So there's a, there's a broad range of uh, state and federal agencies that we work with to make sure uh, that, um, that all regulations are followed. And with that, I will turn it um, back over to Joe. Joseph Reiney for the record, R-I-N-E-Y. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the programs that we have at the Nevada Mining Association. And so, so three of them are on the screen here. One, the first one being Hope for Heat. So Hope for Heat is every day over 100 degrees in the Las Vegas area. We donate $100 to a local school in the community. Um, additionally, Granite Construction supports that, and it has an additional $30. In the north, we do the same thing, but it's a much lower temperature. It doesn't get as hot here. Uh, Mining Vegas for Talent is an exceptional program that we started about two years ago, uh, and really it came out of um, AB 354, I believe. It was creating opportunity for low-income communities, and so what we've created in North Las Vegas is a way to reach the community and really bring the jobs to them. So we hold workshops where folks can come in, learn about the mining industry, and then we, we really fast track them right into the industry, providing housing at several mine operations. Uh, we've had great success with the program. We're looking at scaling it up and adding more operators in it. But as of, as of today, we've had about 20 uh, people go through the program. Um, and obviously this creates exceptional uh, change in that community. These families went from making, you know, minimum wage to uh, $100,000 a year. Um, and that's a lot of that's going back to Vegas. Some of them have moved up north. Uh, very proud of this program. Uh, finally, we have the 360 internship, internship program, which is a collaboration between us and BLM, where students come out of the university in geoscience careers, and they're able to spend a number of weeks at BLM learning the regulatory side from the, the government service side, and then they work at a mine operation and see that. Um, and what that does is it really helps us bridge the gap when we talk uh, to the federal agencies about some of the challenges with permitting or some of the delays. We really have a way to, to identify those issues. Uh, and then the last one, which isn't on the slide, is our annual teacher workshops, which we've done for over 30 years. Uh, we do two teacher workshops a year. We average about 100 attendees in the north and about 140 in the south um, and so over 30 years we've been doing that and teachers get a uh, PDE continuing education credit uh, it doesn't cost them anything and we take them out to the mines and teach them about rocks and minerals thank you uh, I have some questions assembly member Anderson thank you and, and thank you for the presentation um, in another committee, I continue to hear about um, a large percentage of openings in, in employment. So I'm just wondering if you guys are completely at capacity or if you're also uh, continually looking for more people to come into the mining industry. I really like the Mining for Vegas for Talent. I think that's a really important area, but I didn't know if you guys had a uh, certain percentage of individuals who you're still trying to get hired into the mining industry at this time. Uh, Joe Riney, for the record, uh, absolutely. We always have openings available. Uh, I think on average, we're averaging about 300 openings uh, day to day across all of our mine sites. Thank you, and, and thank you for that uh, clarification. And then also, 
Um, has there been any outreach at all for the high school students so that way they can start considering this profession earlier as opposed to waiting until they are at the university level? Joe Riney for the record. Uh, we do do outreach to the high schools. Most of that comes in the form of reaching out to the guidance counselors throughout the state, sharing information. We have uh, career pathway documents that we share that really highlight what you would need to achieve a, co uh, a goal in the mining industry, be it you want to be a metallurgist, an engineer, a haul truck driver. Um, so we have that all spec'd out based on the top 11 jobs in the industry. Um, a heavy, heavy portion of that is CTE programs where we also link them to some resources that uh, of the available trade schools and the opportunities available and really how to achieve those goals. Assembly Member Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, building off my colleague's question, I was just wondering, I, I think there's also in general, so we've talked about geographic diversity, but just also the diversity of the industry. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and um, you know, any recent initiatives or progress in terms of uh, uh, the diversity of, of the industry. Uh, Nikki Bailey Lundahl, for the record. Um, yes, we're constantly, that's constantly an issue for us. We're constantly looking to diversify. Um, there is a, a longstanding organization, Women's Mining Coalition, that works to um, really uh, endorse and show that women in the industry are important and that they need to be in more roles. And so I think that uh, diversity is something that each one of the, uh, and each one of the operations is definitely looking to grow. Thank you for that. Uh, the other question I had, um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, visit several uh, mining operations across the state uh, and have learned a lot through that and, and have had the opportunity to see um, some of the legacy environmental issues and, and efforts to address those, uh, seen some of the, the safety protocols. I know that there's also been a couple of safety incidents. So I was just wondering if you could speak at a high level to some of the the current uh, challenges and innovations in the industry um, related both to safety and also to um, uh, environmental sustainability. Joe Riney, for the record, I'll, uh, I'll take the safety side of it, and then we'll bring somebody in for the environmental side. Um, so we have a lot of exciting things going on, right? Uh, so one of the, one of the, projects we are currently working on at the Nevada Mining Association is what we call first aid uh, for mental health. So it's really built around teaching supervisors. We're putting together a program that'll teach supervisors how to spot mental illness signs in their employees to be able to create that dialogue and maybe create that interaction point that'll, that'll change that pathway. Um, so that is one thing we are working on. Uh, technology is very important. Unfortunately, uh, MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, is not quick to adopt new technology. And actually implementing new technology that uh, improves safety and health for miners is, is a fairly challenging in Denver. Uh, we have a lot of mine operators that are uh, introducing various components of autonomous mining equipment. Uh, most of what you'll see on the mine sites are uh, pit vipers, which are drill rigs in the pits. Um, a lot of those are autonomous or semi-autonomous. We'll see semi-autonomous equipment underground. Uh, we did have a one of our members do a pilot program with large retrofit haul trucks. Uh, it was it was a great program, um, but. To highlight the challenge with MSHA is the first thing out of their mouth was, uh, this is a great program, but this regulation says the parking brake has to be on if there's no driver in the seat. So uh, it kind of defeats the point of autonomy. Um, so we are always looking at, at new and innovative ways to promote health and safety and remove the miner from the hazard. Um, however, it's not always easy to get that path. Madam Chair, Kyle Davis for the record. Um, in regard to your second part of your question, um, I would say the biggest challenge that we're seeing right now um, from the environmental regulation perspective is something you've certainly heard about in other committees, um, and I know that the governor mentioned in the state of the state as well, and that's, um, that's staffing levels of the state. Um, that in order for the... Uh, in order for mines to be permitted and operated, there are certainly a number of regulations um, that uh, that the operators need to follow, and for, for good reason. But that requires uh, permit processing. That requires uh, staffing at agencies to be able to do that. Um, so you know, it's very important to us, to, you know, that we can do something to help bring down the vacancy level at the state because that's that's an important component of um, of overall operations.
Minnie, any other questions? Okay, I'd like to ask about um, reclamation and I know the stated goal is is restoration of the land or productive post mining land use, but there are situations I understand where the land is just kind of fenced off, correct? Right. I mean, like how? What What are the numbers? I mean, I, I understand you don't necessarily have that at hand, but generally, how much is 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 able to be reused versus how much is or able to be used versus how much is is just basically kind of cordoned off and left alone thank you madam chair kyle davis for the record i may give you a a, a short answer but then uh, rely on alan to give you a little bit more as he's you know a little bit more familiar with these operations um but i think the general uh the general i guess philosophy behind the regulation is you, you do restore it to, um, to, to some degree what you, what you may, um, not what you've seen before, but something that can be used. But there are some situations that do create some safety concerns. And that's where you might see something that is fenced off because it does create a safety concern. But that's not, that's not generally the, um, the, the, a large portion of the, uh, of the operation, but that sometimes does happen. And, you know, and if there is a safety issue, then, uh, we do want to make sure that that's, that's not something that's going to cause any problems. Joe Riney, for the record, if I can make a small addition, I think when you think of the fenced off, uh, abandoned mines, we're really looking at some of the legacy sites. Um, these are mines that predate many mining regulations, if, if at all, any mining regulations. So we're talking the 70s, the 60s. Uh, and those are fenced off because they provide um, some type of a warning for public. As public are traveling through the area, maybe exploring, stay out and stay alive. Um, we, I know we do have the Division of Minerals in the room. They do a great job of securing those. But to answer that question, um, it's about 49,000 abandoned mines identified in Nevada. And my name is Alan Biaggi, uh, B-I-A-G-G-I. And I have been the uh, environmental uh, affairs person for Nevada Mining Association for the last 13 years and on my way out and Kyle is taking it over. But I think your question is a good one. And um, obviously the pits are some areas where um, it is not safe for the public to recreate or be near. There's steep walls, there's deep water, there's sometimes eroding slopes. So I think it's fair to say that um, there are times when the pits themselves will need to be uh, cordoned off and out of public access. That's exactly what Assemblyman Bobzian's bill was getting at um, a number of sessions ago. Um, for the majority of the rest of the mine, however, there are opportunities for rec reclamation. And some of the most exciting things we're seeing is um, opportunities for renewable energy, be that wind, be it solar. Much of the infrastructure is already in place um, at the mine for power lines, access roads, and that sort of thing. So while the tradition has been revegetation and wildlife habitat, there's new opportunities for renewable energy, solar, wind, um, geothermal, and other things. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assembly Member LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. So I actually have a, a similar question talking about restoration, and I notice in the slide it says it has to be per, returned to productive post-mining land use. My question is, what? who defines productive? What does that mean? Is there a regulatory agency that oversees that? Because I think there is a very big difference between returning the wildlife that was there versus nothing can grow there, but we have a bunch of solar panels, right? So I just would like a little bit more description there. Sure, once again, Alan Biaggi for the record. Um, Reclamation is not done um, solely by the mine. It is a requirement that has to be planned ahead of time, sometimes even before the mine begins operation, they're planning for reclamation. Um, so it is up to uh, an oversight role by the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, Bureau of Mining Regulation and Reclamation, as well as a federal land manager. Um, most Nevada mines have some portion of of federal land, and so the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service would also be um, consulting within those reclamation plans. Joe Riney, for the record, uh, I just want to address the wildlife piece. So the seed mixture used in the reclamation process is actually more diverse than what grows naturally in Nevada, so you will find an additional uh, amount of wildlife on those reclaimed areas. 
you've just spurred another question. So uh, that's really interesting that it's more diverse than what's there. Does that mean that we're bringing in invasive species into these areas? <laughs> Once again, Alan Biaggi for the record. Um, no, the speed mixture cannot have invasive species, but at times they can have non-native species, and that's sort of a difficult thing sometimes uh, in terms of reclamation. Um, crested wheatgrass, I think, is a, is a perfect example. Sometimes that's used because it's succession species for, for natives, so it allows you to get something on the ground and growing, um, retaining soil, retaining moisture, retaining water, but then it su succeeds uh, the plant species into more natives such as Great Basin Wild Rye, sagebrush, etc. So um, invasives are definitely never encouraged or applied. Okay, seeing no other questions, Thank you very much. And with that, we're going to move to a presentation, an overview of lithium mining operations. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Steeper, Stepper, Mr. Crowley, and uh, Ms. Bandy to all come up and, um, and you can start in whichever order you choose. And then, so maybe what we'll do is, um, these are three different, short presentations committee, but uh, let's save our questions until the end. I thought we had someone from Albemarle. She's on the TV. Oh, she's on the TV? Oh, okay. thank you. Hello. Sorry. Hi, How are you? good to see you. <laughs> so whichever order, go ahead. Messed it up right away. <laughs> That's so for the record, Robert Stepper, S-T-E-P-P-E-R, uh, Director of Process Operations with INAIR. It's not presentation mode. I'm looking at presentation mode. I think you just scroll. I think On it's a scroll. PDF, yeah. All right. Disclaimer, I don't think we have to go through the disclaimers. So a little bit what, what we're here to talk about today is uh, lithium ion battery and electric vehicle supply chain. Right? But it's really a big topic when we talk about the availability of, of lithium for a green energy source or revolution. So, so if we look at, look at this, this chart, what we see is that in the United States, on stage one mining, the United States produces 1%, while China, well, and China produces nothing. On stage, stage two, the United States produces 4% of the chemical processing, China producing 59%. In the stage three, cathode and anode production, the United States produces 0%, while China produces 61 and 83% of the material goes, that goes into our batteries. Uh, and then again, in the stage four, lithium ion battery cell manufacturing. Manufacturing. Uh, the United States, 10%, China, 73%. Which really, re really goes to right, the point of lithium mining in the state of Nevada. Uh, our current production is, is zero, or not zero, that's not true. It's, it's that 4%, so. And if you look at global lithium market trends, uh, current, current production worldwide uh, just simply can't meet the supply of, of the EV revolution. There's not enough lithium to generate the cars uh, that we want to generate. It just it doesn't exist. It's not being mined. And we have to reverse that. We have to get to a place where where the car, where the batteries, where the cars can be made, uh, otherwise, uh, it's just not going to work. So, so if you, oh, that's right. So if you look at look at this, so gigafactory capacity and demand. 
So 2021 actual, we're 56 gigawatt hours, number of gigafactories, four. If we move out 2026, gigawatt hour factories, 588 gigawatt hours, 26 factories, demand 504 kilowatt. 31, again, 965 gigawatt hours, 26 gigafactories. Forecast domestic supply, actual supply 2021, 5,000 tons per annum lithium carbonate. 2025 forecast, a need of 122,000 tons lithium carbonate. So you can see that the supply does not meet the demand. It's not there. Lithium deposits in the U.S. Lithium can be derived from conventional brine, spodumene or sedimentary resources. America is severely constrained in its capacity to produce lithium from conventional deposits. Only two known conventional deposits in America, the active Silver Peak in Nevada and a potential lithium mine from Spodumene in the Carolinas. South America dominates brine production today and seems poised to continue to do, do so given quantities of economical developed resources. Australia has competitive advantage with spodumene-based production, higher grade, easier to mine, less challenging to move materials to China. All spodumene raw ore or production is sent to China for, for processing and refining. Sedimentary deposits in the U.S. America has significant opportunities to produce large quantities of battery-grade lithium materials from sedimentary deposits. Approximately 26 sedimentary lithium projects in various stages of development in Nevada. There are two significant large-scale sedimentary projects in late-stage development in Nevada. Combined, Stage one development can produce lithium materials to supply production of greater than 1 million electric cars per year for 50 years. U.S. risk near-term domestic shortages of materials essential to its clean energy transition without these projects. So additional extraction technology opportunities so possible opportunities for direct extraction from fluids with elevated amounts of lithium, brines in Nevada, approximately 35 lithium brine projects, various stages of development in Nevada. The active mine in Nevada is a conventional brine operation with solar evaporation ponds. But we're also talking about hot fluids, or hot fluids from Arkansas oil plants, or brines, and salt and sea geothermal wells but more testing and proof of concept is needed, and it could take decades. Real quick, I and I are Rylite Ridge location, Esmeralda County, just outside of Dyer. You can see the project right here. Little fact sheet about, about INAIR, so the project stage, so INAIR has a bankable feasibility study as of April 2020. Uh, products are lithium carbonate. Uh, resources, 146.5 million tons. Uh, production annual, 22,000 tons per annum. Of lithium, 174,400 tons per annum of, of boron. CapEx for the prop, or Cap, CapEx P50 is $785 million. All in sustaining cash costs, $2,510 a ton. And, and I can go through this pretty quick. But the highlights, so it's, we like to say we're the most advanced lithium project in the U.S. You can uh, say what you want. <laughs> 
but it is a world, world scale resource. It's a unique lithium boron deposit. We have 26 plus year mine life with significant upside from base resource. Expected low cost lithium producer, uh, fully funded to final investment decision. Uh, we have binding lithium and boron offtake agreements and we have conditional debt and equity in place for approximately $1.2 billion. So a little comparison so you can see uh, the lithium bor boron sericite core. Uh, and on the left, I guess it would be everybody's left. And on the right, uh, the lithium, lithium clay. Nobody wants to be bored with geology, do they? <laughs> oh, sorry. So Ioneer's commitment to sustainability. Uh, so, so low emissions. Uh, the majority of on-site power will be bent by CO2-free energy production. Uh, low greenhouse gas emissions. Mobile equipment meeting tier, all Tier 4 standards. Low water usage. Project design implements best in water class, or class water utilization while recycling the majority of water usage. So we've spent a lot of time on water recycling technologies to make sure we, we, we utilize that water to, to the best of our ability. A small mine footprint, no evaporation ponds or a tailing dam, so we're able to keep the footprint pretty small. Efficient equipment, generating all power on site, and having a full automated autonomous uh, mine haul fleet. Our commitment to sustainability, all baseline studies for the EIS completed over two years, ongoing commitment to the environment and protection and conservation of TM's buckwheat, and implementation of TM, TSM and ESG programs. So you can see a little bit of what we're doing with the TM's buckwheat. Uh, so we do have a greenhouse. We have been actively collecting seeds, planting, and propagating uh, the TM buckwheat at, at our greenhouse, and, and it's doing fabulous. So the Fish and Wildlife listed the buckwheat as an endangered species, effective December 22nd. Uh, the plant exists in the Silver Peak Range, uh, area restricted to approximately 10 acres, three square mile area. I don't know what we need to go through. At the same time, force, at the same time, Fish Wildlife Service designated critical habitat for the species on approximately 100 or 910 acres in Esmeralda County. INR has, on multiple occasions, modified its mining plan to avoid direct impacts and minimize indirect impacts to the plant. Project will be subject to Section 7 consultation under the EPA. INR's ongoing efforts for the TM, TM's buckwheat are aimed at addressing current and future threats to the species, including, including climate-related threats. Under the supervision of a full-time botanist, INR is conducting, is conducting scientific research to further increase knowledge of the species and has spent over $2 million on TM buckwheat research and conservation efforts to date. INR is operating and is dedicated, operating a dedicated greenhouse near Gardnerville where plants are being successfully grown from seed collected from known populations. INR continues to work with Fish Wildlife, BLM, and the Nevada Division DCNR to accommodate issues raised and remains confident that the coexistence of bryolite and the TM's buckwheat is achievable. You can see the, the process facility at, I, at Rhyolite Ridge, the crushing lithium carbonate circuit, batch leaches, evaporation, sulfuric acid plant, uh, power plants, plant utilities, boric acid circuits, and reagents. And I believe there's a very good video of this whole thing, good explanation on YouTube if anybody's interested.
Thank you for that. And before we have questions, I think we're just going to do all of the presentations at once. So please go ahead. Okay. Um, sure. Thank you. I have some slides to pull up. Well, maybe it's this one. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tim Crowley. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs and Community Relations for Lithium Americas. And um, I, I'm real grateful for you to having this showcase on our industry today. We're building a project that we're quite proud of and, and look forward to highlighting it for you. So let me just start with some of the highlights. Um, we recently, well, f before I do that, take a look at the map on the right just to orient yourself to where we are. Um, we're about 60 miles, um, our, our project, the Thacker Pass project, is about 60 miles north of Winnemucca. If you look at the state, the, the map of the state, you'd head due north up uh, US 95 and hang a left at Orvada. And the, the long, dark blotch uh, labeled Thacker Pass is our, our plan of operations footprint. That's not, the, that's not the footprint of the mine itself. Within that plan of operations footprint is uh, uh, 6,000 acres for the mining uh, facility, and within that 6,000 acres is, uh, is a mine, but also a chemical manufacturing pro uh, plant. And we really are our expertise as a company is in chemical manufacturing and producing high purity lithium carbonate for the battery industry. Um, so some of the highlights I, I want to focus on today and then drill into uh, a little bit more with some of the other slides is that we recently in the last couple of weeks uh, formed a partnership with General Motors. Uh, they are now our largest shareholder. Uh, it's a strategic partnership that allows them to have all of our offtake for at least the next 10 years, possibly longer, uh, and, it, and they provide the capital to help us move forward. Uh, we've also received a favorable, favorable uh, a ruling on an appeal to our record of decision. So a record of decision is the federal government making going through the NEPA process, which started years ago when we started collecting data analyzing our project. We submitted a plan of operations to the Bureau of Land Management. They took that plan of operations and they conducted an environmental impact statement. Uh, that impact statement was uh, completed a couple years ago. It was appealed and, and we've, we've come out of that appeal just in the last uh, 10 days uh, very favorably. All of our state uh, permits have been completed and we're ready to go into construction. Uh, construction is expected to begin this year. Uh, and we've hired our what's called an EPCM, uh, Engineering Procurement and Construction Management Firm, to, to carry out the, um, the construction. And I'll talk about that, that company, Bechtel, a little bit more. Um, we've uh, successfully completed a community benefits agreement with the Fort McDermott tribe. You can see on the map uh, the town of McDermott. That's about a 50-mile drive. It's, it's about 35 miles uh, as the crow flies, but it's about a 50-mile drive to the town of McDermott adjacent to the town is Fort McDermott, and they're the clo closest tribe to our project. Uh, we also completed and released recently a new feasibility study that shows that we're going to produce when we're fully up and scaled, we'll produce 80,000 tons of lithium carbonate. To put that in perspective, the United States currently produces 5,000 tons of lithium carbonate. That's the 1% that Mr. Stepper talked about. Uh, we're going to increase that by 16 times. Now, we'll scale up, so our first phase will be 40,000 tons, uh, and then once we complete phase two, we will, we will produce 80,000 tons. And uh, we also uh, completed the construction and we're operating a lithium technical development center in Reno. It's essentially a pilot plant, a, a lab for us to make sure that we're innovative and, and continuing to uh, find efficiencies in how we process our lithium, but also in how we plan for the future and accommodate 
future technologies in, in batteries. Um, we're going through the loan process with the Department of Energy. We've, we've applied for a loan, and uh, just on Friday, we got a letter of substantial completion to our application. That means that we go into the next phase, which is due diligence, and we, uh, we hope to be awarded a loan uh, from, the, from the DOE in the near future. So Rob talked a lot about supply and demand. I won't dwell on this on this slide, but you you can see, and Mr. Stepper pointed it out, that there is a gap in in supply. We we will in a ver in very short time uh, in the next couple of years hit a gap. Now this is world uh, supply and demand, and so it's possible that we could procure as a country the materials we need, but those assurances are becoming less and less dependable. And onshoring the raw materials we need to have a very efficient um, energy system and electrification of our economy is essential. Uh, the Biden administration sees it that way and has put tremendous amount of, of attention and, and resources into making sure that we onshore that piece. So as this gap, which is coming, um, happens that we have the materials we need to be successful. A little bit more about the deal with General Motors. What, what they have agreed to do is invest $650 million in common shares in our company. And the first payment of that, uh, that commitment was made last week. Uh, th that's a payment of $320 million. They are now our largest shareholder. And with that commitment comes uh, a, a guarantee that we will sell them um, all of our offtake for the next 10 years with an option to go a bit longer. That's enough material for General Motors to make upward toward a, a million vehicles a year. And, and Mr. Crowley, I'm sorry, I mean, we, I had, I was planning to have these presentations be around five to seven minutes long, and, and um, I, I need to kind of get us, get I, us going. I can um, do that easily. I'm, okay, I'm really happy. You. I put I front-loaded all the things I really wanted to communicate. Now I'm just repeating the good stuff. So um, let me just uh, leave you with a, a notion or, or a fact that we're really striving to be uh, have a low carbon footprint, and we're doing that by self-generating 45 megawatts a year of our power by capturing heat in, in a chemical process at our plant. We're very low water consuming. Uh, uh, we will be a very low water consuming operation, and that's done by uh, recycling. 86% of all the water we use, our processing will take place indoors, and we'll recycle that water. And we're minimizing our environmental impact. And one of the things I really want to point out, because Madam Chair, you, you asked this question earlier, is that we are reclaiming our site to a point where you can use the whole thing afterward. The, the way we do that is we are doing it is by backfilling as we go. And we're going to do concurrent backfilling. So after year five, we'll have enough space opened up in our pit to be able to start putting material back in that we won't be processing. We've hey. done. Oh, sorry. I, I, I can do this in two seconds. We've done great cultural clearance, great community engagement. I want you to see this uh, school that we've committed to build in Orvada. We're also building a community center and daycare facility at the uh, Fort McDermott tribe. And um, we're also improving this intersection that you can see here, adding it's 295 and I'm sorry, it's 95 and 293. That's being done at our expense. And we're going to go into construction right away. Uh, Bechtel, I'll just add, is going to do that construction. They did the, the recent terminal at the Harry Reid Airport. They built the Hoover Dam. Uh, they're very reputable, world class, uh, very, very, very safe, environmentally re responsible uh, company. So I'll leave it with that, and, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Um, and then. Uh, please uh, go ahead, Ms. Bandy, if, if you could do a uh, quick version of your Wonderful. presentation. Yes, I will do so. So let's see here. I just need to, to get to this. So while I'm getting this up and running, can you see that okay? Yes. Is that, is that showing okay for you? 
Okay, thank you. All right, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Meredith Bandy. I'm the Vice President of Investor Relations and Sustainability for Albemarle Corporation. So for those of you who don't know Albemarle, we are a uh, leading specialty chemicals company. Uh, we have about 7,000 employees around the world. We serve about 1,900 customers across 70 countries. This year, we had just over $7 billion of net sales. About two-thirds of that was in our core energy storage business. That is the business that includes our battery grade and industrial lithium assets. We are a Virginia corporation headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, enlisted on the NYSE. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about our sustainability and innovations as well as the um, production that we're doing. Like your other presenters tonight, you know, with our position in the clean transportation, clean energy transformation, sustainability is really core to everything we do at Albemarle. It's part of our purpose. It aligns with our core values. Um, and it's a, it's a pillar of our strategy. So I'll just to highlight two items here. One is the work that we're doing with the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. The great thing about IRMA is that it is a multi-stakeholder model. So it's not just producers coming together and saying this is what's right for the industry, but it's really, um, it's not, it's also our customers. So people like Ford and GM and Tesla, it's uh, labor unions like the United Steelworkers and also NGOs like Human Rights Watch. I'll also highlight that our asset in uh, Silver Peak, Nevada, this year uh, received two different responsible care awards from the American Chemistry Council uh, for energy usage and, and water conservation. As everyone else has said here today, we see tremendous growth in the lithium market. Our expectation is for lithium demand of 3.7 million tons by 2030. And we believe that even with extensive growth in supply, we'll see a supply shortage by 2030 of around 800,000 tons. That would be about 20% of supply being short, even with things like recycling and non-traditional resources. This is Albemarle's energy storage global footprint. So two things I'll highlight for you here. We do have a global footprint and we're vertically integrated. So that means we have access to world-class resources and conversion sites all around the world, including in the United States um, at Silver Peak, of course, but also in Kings Mountain, North Carolina and Magnolia, Arkansas. So we're really well positioned to help build the EV supply chain here in the United States. These are the two main processes, very overly simplified, but two main processes we use today all around the world to convert lithium resources into battery-grade materials. So you can see that in Silver Peak, we're using um, the same brine concentration processes we use in Chile as well. So our Clayton Valley brine is four times saltier than seawater. It is a mineral resource. It can't be used for fresh water or for irrigation. And we don't use any chemicals in our extraction process. We use passive solar energy to concentrate the brine, and that allows us to avoid the emission of 1.4 million tons of greenhouse gases every year. Once the brine is uh, reaching an ideal lithium concentration, then we transfer it to our, um, our lithium production facility. We convert it to lithium carbonate, and in some cases, we then ship it to um, Kings Mountain for further processing into lithium hydroxide. That's not the only process we use. There are a lot of different processes for converting lithium into uh, battery grade materials, and we look at a lot of them. You can see the yellow boxes there are the ones that we're currently using, and the gray boxes are, are areas where we're currently doing research. So for example, direct lithium extraction, I know is an area that we get a lot of questions about, and perhaps you all will have questions as well. Direct lithium extraction, or DLE, is really a term, an umbrella term for a lot of different technologies that can be used for difficult to process brine or in areas where solar evaporation is not possible, perhaps a lower elevation or a more humid climate. And we do look at DLE for a lot of our processes, for example, in Magnolia, Arkansas. The challenge with DLE is really you're basically producing a synthetic brine. So it does require quite a bit of fresh water and it requires energy, and it also requires the addition of solvents or chemicals to create that synthetic brine. It is in use in some areas today, like in Argentina, uh, but it's not a one-size-fits-all. Every brine is different, and so every um, one has to be carefully calibrated for that resource, um, and it typically is quite difficult to go on 
from a bench scale in the lab to an industrial scale. That's not the only area where we're doing innovation. For example, we work closely with our customers around new battery materials. In North Carolina, we have a battery materials innovation center, and that allows us to take our lithium products and test them in real world manufacturing conditions so that we can get better alignment with our customers about how our materials will interact with their manufacturing process and allows us to out accelerate development of new lithium materials. So what does this mean for Nevada and Silver Peak? So Albemarle and our predecessor companies have operated in Silver Peak since 1966. Uh, today we produce around 4,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. We have announced plans to expand to 7,500 tons. Um, and at that point, as some of your other presenters have pointed out, that would be the equivalent of around 170,000 battery electric vehicles per year. Silver Peak material is used in a broad range of applications in the interest of time. I'll, I'll let you read them on your own, but uh, supporting a lot of different innovations. In January of 2021, we did announce an expansion of our Silver Peak facility, and I'm happy to present to present that this is going really well. Uh, we are planning to invest $80 million to expand Silver Peak, and we've spent about half of that so far. Um, we have completed 22 new wells, so our well program is complete. We've also completed the supporting infrastructure for those wells. Our new liming plant is under construction. And I apologize, in your printed copies, there is a typo. We have submitted the authorization to construct our new pond enhancement. Uh, we can submitted that in February of 2023, so we would expect to begin that in the spring of 2023. And we're also in engineering studies for our carbonate plant. So very going very well and continuing. I'll also highlight some of the socioeconomic impacts from our Silver Peak site. Uh, we currently employ around 67 people directly at our site. The average compensation for those folks is just over $100,000 a year which is 42% higher than the Nevada average. Most of our employees are coming really from the direct communities around the site, Silver Peak, Goldfield, Tonopah. Some come as far as Las Vegas or Reno. Uh, we're also very proud of the work that our foundation has done, providing um, uh, emergency services for the local community, um, schools, and also um, health care. And I'll just point out that a significant amount of these economic contributions are staying locally in Nevada and also uh, in the local Esmeralda County region. And lastly, I'll just end on our avian protection program. So we have worked very closely with the Nevada Division of Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on our avian protection program. We spent about $2 million on this program to date. And basically what it is is in the evaporation ponds where we work, some of them are perfectly fine for birds, but some of them when the brine gets more concentrated are not healthy for birds. So we take steps to keep the birds off of those ponds in cases where we can't do that. We have the ability to rescue those birds and send them to our state-of-the-art rehabilitation facility until they can be released. So that is a very high-level view of Albemarle and our operations in Nevada. I'm very happy to take your question. So thank you very much. And, and again, I'm, I'm very sorry about the, the time issue, but um, what I'm going to do is make sure that all the committee members get uh, your contact information and have the committee members send their questions offline. But we really do appreciate uh, the presentations, and I know that there will be some questions coming your way. Uh, for all of you. No? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll bring the presentation. Uh, <laughs> with that, we'll bring our presentations to the end. And thank you very much again for that. And we will move on to public comment. Anyone for public comment in Las Vegas, uh, in Las Vegas please come to the tables. Um, and anyone for public comment in Carson City, please come to the tables. And you have, so seeing no one in Las Vegas, uh, you have two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly, Great Basin Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. I'd like to take a minute to speak about Teams Buckwheat. Teams Buckwheat is a rare Nevada wildflower that lives on just 10 acres of land in the Silver Peak Range in Esmeralda County. This incredibly precious emblem of Nevada's biodiversity faces an acute risk of extinction due to the Rhyolite Ridge lithium mine we just heard about. 
There's a global extinction crisis happening right now. Over a million species are at risk of extinction around the world, and it's happening right here in Nevada with Teams Buckwheat. Now, the original mine plans involved destroying almost the entirety of Teams Buckwheat's habitat. The newest plan has proposed avoiding a narrow strip of land containing all the buckwheats, what I like to call Buckwheat Island. They propose a 1,000 foot deep open pit, which would come within just 12 feet of these endangered plants. With dust, disruption to pollinators, and general human disturbance, this plan would condemn Teams Buckwheat to extinction. Over 100 scientists just sent a letter to BLM a few weeks ago agreeing with that sentiment. In light of these threats, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed Teams Buckwheat as endangered under the Endangered Species Act in December, citing Ioneer's mine as the main threat causing it to face extinction, and said the mine plan would destroy 38% of the buckwheat's critical habitat. The mine would have significant environmental impacts, including a pit as deep as the Eiffel Tower is tall, over 1,000 football fields of waste rock dumps, over 100 semi-trucks a day full of sulfur being brought in, sucking down over a billion gallons of water per year, and driving Teams Buckwheat to extinction. In short, the Rhyolite Ridge mine would be an environmental calamity. We need lithium for electric vehicles. We do not dispute that. There are places and ways to produce it that don't cause extinction. But the extinction crisis is happening right here and now in Nevada, and it starts with the Rhyolite Ridge mine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please go ahead, whichever one of you would like to go next. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Amanda Hilton, A-M-A-N-D-A-H-I-L-T-O-N, the general manager of Robinson Nevada Mining Company, Nevada's largest copper mine operating in White Pine County. Of the 9,700 White Pine County residents, Robinson directly employs over 600 people, which equates to approximately 15% of our county's total workforce. These are jobs with high wages and high quality health insurance. Three mines in White Pine County comprise 46% of the total assessed value for the county. To summarize, mining is the economic engine in our county and has been for more than 150 years. As one of the key minerals in the green energy economy, the demand for copper continues to increase. Every electric vehicle requires more than 130 pounds of copper. It is also a key mineral in the manufacturing of solar panels and construction materials. We are proud that we get to be a significant contributor in the green energy transition. Our most important core value is zero harm. This means zero harm to our people, the environment, and the community in which we operate. We take these commitments very seriously. Assemblyman Watts, diversity is also very important at Robinson, but we recognize that our so social structures need to be in place for diversity to be successful. We recently made the seed donation for a new daycare center in Ely, and once that daycare is operating, we will be able to offer jobs to people who typically had to stay home and take care of their children. But we know we have to have these social systems in place. I want to thank you all for your service to our state and for your um, continued support of this important industry in Nevada. Thank you, please go ahead, ma'am. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Alyssa Wood and I am head of communities and corporate affairs for Barrick North America. At Nevada Gold Mines, which is operated by Barrick, proactively managing sustainability is in our DNA. We recognize that to be successful, we have an obligation to be responsible stewards of the environment, good neighbors, and conscientious community partners. To achieve this, Nevada Gold Mines proactively looks for opportunities to partner and engage with our host communities, including our 10 Native American partner tribes, to address community needs in a sustainable way. Our approach is simple. We foster solid, long-term relationships with community stakeholders that are, that are built upon trust, transparency, respect, and partnership. These relationships constitute our social license to operate, or LTO, and are critical to our business model. Our LTO is managed through four primary methods to ensure that contributions made are effective now, as well as sustainable long-term. The first is through engagement. At Nevada Gold Mines, we make a point to collaborate with and learn from community and tribal leaders, businesses, and employees to gain insight into community needs. It's through partnership. NGM fosters relationships between community members and nonprofits, 
small businesses, schools, and local groups in order to maximize the economic and social benefits of our contributions and to encourage philanthropy in others. These relationships are real partnerships with mutual respect and responsibility. It's through investment. Our business model focuses on sourcing goods, services, and employment locally. In 2022, NGM's business expenses, including local tax contributions and community development initiatives, totaled $2.7 billion. And then lastly, it's through sustainability. In 2022, NGM contributed $17.9 million to community programs and initiatives. The majority and, of which- And I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap up for two minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, please go ahead. All right, good, good. I was about to say afternoon. Good evening, Madam Chair and Committee. I'm Greg Gibson, G-I-B-S-O-N, and I'm the current board chair for the Nevada Mining Association, representing nearly 600 members across the state, nation, and even globally. The mission of the Nevada Mining Association is to unite, educate, advocate, and serve as the public voice for Nevada's modern mining industry. Although the association has served Nevada for well over 100 years, the key takeaway in our mission is really about modern mining. Nevada history is rich with the mining story, but the story we tell today is one more about safety excellence, workforce development, environmental regulation, uh, community engagement, gov government relations, and education. With about 40,000 Nevada jobs from the mine operators to, from the mine operators all the way to the supply chain employees and beyond, mining pays approximately 2.5 billion annually in salaries to Nevadans. Nevada makes an impact across the nation as well, producing over 10% of non-fuel non mineral production domestically. We like to say, if it's not grown, it must be mined. Mining not only makes an impact our state and those within our industry, but also has the honor of impacting the lives of Nevadans all, and all, those will be far beyond. I uh, briefly just want to ad address the reclamation question as well. The mine operators out there, we're always looking for opportunities to do concurrent reclamation, doing the right things out there to restore land back to productive uses. So I can definitely say for Marigold, the operation that I work with out there in Valmy, uh, deer definitely like the habitat, and that's somewhere where you can almost always go to see deer population. So thanks. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Committee. My name is John Hatter. I'm the uh, director of Great Basin Resource Watch. Uh, we're a Nevada-based nonprofit public interest organization. We've been around since 1995, uh, monitoring uh, the extractive industries and, and mining in Nevada. And our mission is that we support communities to protect their land, air, and water, and culture from the adverse effects of mining. <laughs> Clearly, we use materials mined. <laughs> That's all. The room is all around us with this stuff. At the same time, mining can be very damaging uh, to ecosystems and where it occurs, and often, very dis and often disruptive to communities. We have to recognize this, and those communities are called frontline communities, and they're disproportionately affected, not in the way we're affected. They're very disproportionately affected, so it's very important to consider that. And, on, and beyond a local level, on a global level, um, there's a significant footprint to mining. We have to think about that also as we move forward. According to the United Nations, inter an international resource panel, quote, annually the extraction of metals and minerals has significantly risen from 11.6 billion tons in 1970 to 53.1 billion tons in 2017, accounting for 20 percent of climate impacts. The upshot of this is that in our permitting process and our regulation must be done carefully, it must be done judiciously to ensure that all the consequences, both envir environmental and to frontline peoples, are fully explored. And on top of that, what measures are we, do we have in place to minimizing, minimize the damaging effects of mining proposals? Are our laws and regulations as protective as possible? I encourage all of you as legislators, we're part, you're responsible for this protection in part and our, and our, our agencies are responsible for enforcing it. Seek out other sources of information in addition to the mining industry. Frontline communities are affected. To let them tell you their stories. We work with frontline communities all the time, so other nonprofits like and ours can provide maybe another perspective. Sir, me, we're at two minutes, so please wrap up. Okay. Let me give you a simple example. We, we talked about mining pit sure. lakes. Wrap up. 
earlier. We're at two minutes. Okay, okay. Let me just say this little simple, simple example here. We'll, we'll take a couple seconds, okay? Please. S sir, uh, we're at two minutes. I'm sorry. You're welcome okay, to well, anyway, the they said apple. groundwater was, they said pit lakes were groundwater, sir? and yet it's, uh, well, I'm, okay, sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Did the best I could with the time I had. You're Thank welcome you very much. to email the committee. We, Please I, go I, ahead, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Chair. Please press the button. Okay. Thank Good you. Evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Nancy Egan. I'm the Native American Affairs Manager with Nevada Gold Mines. And NGM has been a long standing mining company when it comes to leading the way for Native American engagement within the industry. In fact, NGM has had a team dedicated to, engage, to transparent engagement, long term sustainability, and partnership with the Great Basin Native American tribes for the past 15 years. The collaborative agreement formed between MGM and our 10 partner tribes shows the company's dedication to understanding and preserving the native way of life. In 22 alone, MGM invested 3.5 million into various tribal initiatives, including the New Anuma Scholarship Foundation, NNSF. NNSF established in 2008 has been able to support countless Native American students through their post-secondary education. Since its inception, 6.4 million, equaling 2,353 scholarships have been awarded. Other noteworthy tribal community initiatives include the Elder Energy Assistance Program, providing heat costs to elders, the Summer Youth Employment Program, the NNSF Summer Internship Program, as well as the Nuwanuma Native American Mural to visually honor the Native American culture. Additional in internal mandatory NGM employee cultural awareness training was created in collaboration with our partner tribes to ensure awareness and understanding of the history, challenges the Native Americans have faced, and the policies and procedures NGM follows regarding the discovery of cultural artifacts. One of the many ways Native American Affairs Department remains actively engaged with the NA community is through hosting quarterly dialogue meetings. NGM senior leadership attends these meetings to ensure the company is fully vested in developing and providing sustainable long-term benefits for its 10 partnering tribes. In conclusion, Nevada Gold Mines is proud to have the relationship we do have with the Great Basin American tribes, one that is built on transparent engagement and sustainable and you're continuing at two minutes. Thank, thank you for thank your you, time today. Okay, seeing no one else for public comment in Carson City, do we have anyone on the phones BPS? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada. Plan believes everyone has the right to live in a clean and healthy environment, regardless of their race, income, or where in the state they live. Addressing our dependence on an extractive economy is central to our environmental justice campaign. It is important as we just discuss our state's extractive economies to talk about the communities impacted by the mine site and their input in the process. Just recently, Reno Sparks Indian Colony, Burns Paiute Tribe, and the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe filed an additional federal lawsuit alleging that the Bureau of Land Management withheld information, lied about the extent of, of tribal consultation in order to secure legally required concurrence about historic properties, and misled the tribes about other aspects of the mining at Backer Pass, a location known to them as Pahimaha. Today, you only heard one side of the story on Sacker Pass, but it is essential that all frontline communities be consulted and included in these conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment on the phones? My name is Jaina Moan, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N and I am the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Madam Chair and members of the committee, we appreciate Mr. Biagi's mention of renewable energy as a post-mining use. We just wanted to chime in and let the committee know of a program called Mining the Sun that the Nature Conservancy, 
where we're striving to make it easier to site renewable energy on mine lands, brownfields, and other disturbed spaces. DNC recently calculated that these lands have the potential to generate 4.6 gigawatts of electricity in Nevada that could avoid conversion of 396,000 acres of open space for energy development. Also, we appreciate the discussion on lithium mining in the state. In August 2022, the Nature Conservancy released a report that analyzed the opportunities and costs posed by different lithium extraction methods and the potential threats to lands and waters at potential extraction sites in nine U.S. states, including in Nevada. That report can be found at www.scienceforconservation.org slash products slash lithium. Thank you for the opportunity to share these resources with you. Thank you. Next person on the phones for public comment. My name is Mary Kerner, M-A-R-Y-K-E-N-E-R, -E and I'm a wife of a miner in White Pine County, and I also have a son who works in mining in Elko County. Today, I would like to speak to you as the CEO of the Rural Nevada Development Corporation. I am proud of Nevada mining, not only for the many jobs and careers they offer, but also for the corporate and social responsibility programs, from promoting employee volunteerism to the many ways they give to their A few examples of this include the Robinson Mine here in White Pine County purchases thousands of dollars in local chamber bucks for employee incentive and awards programs. These dollars are then recycled back into the community, promoting shopping local. Another example is the Nevada Gold Mines in Elko County. They seeded the I-80 fund with a $5 million contribution to my agency, and we manage this fund. It's an amazing economic development tool. In the four northern counties of where they have a geographic footprint, we have lent over $6.3 million in small business loans, which created 125 jobs and retained 207 jobs. Mining in Nevada has helped fund education, large-scale large broadband projects, daycare facilities, environmental and health programs, cultural heritage, and many more. I value the partnerships their minds have with our system of higher education, the summer internship for high school students, the science programs offered in middle and elementary schools. Mining isn't just a career, it is a way of life, especially in rural Nevada. The economic development spurred by mining the minerals in our state is hugely important to Nevada's economic health overall, and I am proud to be connected to the Nevada mining community. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Next person on the phones for public comment. Sorry, Chair, we have more people, but uh, we're having trouble unmuting. Hold on just one moment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Allison Anderson, and I'm proud to be the Community and Government Affairs Manager at I-80 Gold. I also currently serve as the chair of the Nevada Mining Association's Education Committee. This committee is run by industry partners who volunteer to host two free earth science workshops a year for K-12 teachers. I-80 Gold is a uniquely Nevadan company with four operations here in Northern Nevada. As the company name may have implied, we are mining for gold, and our sites are located along Interstate 80, specifically between Battle Mountain, Winnemucca, and extending over to Ruby Hill in beautiful Eureka, Nevada. In just a month and a half, we will celebrate our two-year anniversary, and we have much to be proud of. Above all, I want to highlight our commitment to people, providing quality jobs, keeping our employees and contractors safe, and participating in the communities we live and work in. We currently employ 130 talented individuals and continue to foster an environment of diversity and inclusion. In fact, women comprise 34% of our workforce. I'm proud to be one of them, and this job helps me to support myself and my three children. 
It has been a privilege to work in Nevada's mining industry over the last four years. This industry is filled with hardworking and forward-thinking folks who care about their neighbors, our resources, and the future of Nevada. I-80 Gold is committed to sustainable and development of our environmental stewardship during exploration and extraction of mineral resources. As we continue to grow our team and our operations, our top priorities are safety and maintaining the environmental and economic well-being of our partner community. Thank you to the committee for your time. Next person on the phones for public comment. Cyrus Hojati. All I have to point out is that if you're not really a fan of all this resource extraction and all this resource consumption and everything else, and I think I've mentioned you this before, the real source of the problem to starve the beef is to go after the credit financial system. If it weren't for loans given by the Federal Reserve and Wall Street, much of the, the demand for mining resources, as well as lumber for home building, which is a huge part of our economy, gasoline, the list goes on, would not exist. Now, I'm curious to know that why haven't any of you, I could be wrong, have talked about restructuring our financial system after the crisis that happened 15 years ago. See, most people are not able to buy products from their pocket. A lot of it is loan. And that is running of our economy. And sadly, that is what pumps this entire national and global economy, Las Vegas disproportionately. So I'm glad that resources are a huge part of our economy. But if you're not happy about the demand, starve the beast. Thank you so much. Yield my time. Next person on the phones, please. My name is Genevieve Merrill, G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E-M-E-R-R-I-L-L. -E 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 Madam Chair and members of the committee, <clears throat> I am employed as a safety professional with Robinson Nevada Mining Company, and I am the chair of the Eastern Nevada section of the Society of Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration. My husband and I are proud to work in the mining industry in eastern Nevada at a large open pit copper mine that employs approximately 620 people and hundreds of contractors. Mining provides high wages and excellent health insurance for miners to support their families. A value we hold is zero harm to our stakeholders, inclusive of our people, our community, and our environment. <clears throat> our mine site just achieved 2 million work hours with no lost time incidents. As Robinson is the largest employer in White Pine County, that means we are promoting a culture of safety that is taken home with our miners and shared with their families and in our community. <clears throat> Mining and the benefits it brings to our local economy are paramount in supporting our community development, <clears throat> our local schools, parks, recreation, and many small businesses that might not exist without the outreach, support, and contributions made by our industry. <clears throat> I have been so impressed with the support the mining industry has provided to our local schools by providing funding for CTE programs, tools for their trades, and equipment for welding programs, even donating services of our skilled miners to teach welding classes at our local high school. Mining has provided us a means to have rewarding careers with steady incomes to raise our eight children in rural Nevada and continue their education beyond high school. We are proud that we have two daughters who are pursuing careers in mining. One's at UNR School of Engineering and the other is studying accounting and finance. Both have worked previous summer internships at Robinson Mine where they have had the opportunity to learn about responsible mining and proactive environmental stewardship. Many Nevada mining families share stories similar to ours. Nevada miners are committed to social and, and that's environmental two minutes, responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else on the phones for public comment? Chair, the public lines are open and working, but that was our last caller. Thank you. With that, I will bring the hearing to a close. Uh, we will have another hearing at 4 o'clock on Wednesday. Thank you very much.